Hi, hello again uh, on my scientific channel Discover Social Sciences. Uh, you can see the website address here below me in the video window. Uh, in this video I am starting uh, still another path of educational material. If you have been following my channel, if you have been following my blog, at discoversocialsciences.com. You could have seen that I am developing recently a lot of educational material. Yes, it is end of August 2020 and uh, in one month we are starting the academic year. Most likely we will go very heavily online. We will go very heavily towards online learning and online teaching and thus we need a lot of material to show to students and essentially I feel like treating some topics in the forms of educational videos. It just helps me thinking. It is something that I discovered a long time ago. Anyway, in this uh, video it is or this video is the first in a separate series of educationals. Uh, it is devoted to urban economics and city management. And those videos are somehow connected with the book that I am writing about the civilizational role of cities. And I want to start uh, where I essentially started to do research on the topic. And I want to start where I started to, uh, uh, to write my book or to uh, like sketch my first notes for that book. Uh, so it is the phenomenon of pandemic and lockdowns which we, which we could observe this year. I very clearly remember uh, it was I think the beginning of March uh, 2020. Uh, it was the beginning of like serious lockdowns. I was cycling through my hometown, through Kraków in Poland. I was cycling from my home to the campus of my university and the city was or, or looked like in post-apocalyptic movies. It was practically deserted, it was quasi empty. I have never seen my hometown as empty on a working day in the middle of the day. And I had that strange question that kept resonating and still keeps resonating in my mind. How many human footsteps does a city need to be really alive and functioning? Strange question, a little bit poetic, but in this video I go down this avenue to like disentangle my first thoughts and my lines of research as regards uh, those urban economics and uh, city management. So I will go uh, into a window with a little help of, uh, uh, of PowerPoint presentation. Okay, let me go there. I prepared something. This is essentially a rare presentation, so a second presentation, a little bit modified and enriched of some content which I placed online, I think in April or in May. Hmm? So here is a little bit more content. You can uh, see the. if you follow my channel, you can see there approximately the same, um, the same slides. Anyway, there is that claim that the lockdowns which we undertook to flatten down the COVID-19 pandemic curve are something unique in history. It was being claimed, for example, by the president of France, uh, Emmanuel Macron, by, by governors in the state of, uh, of, uh, of California and I think in the state of New Jersey. Anyway, uh, is it really so unique and is it really and how those lockdowns and how the pandemic is going to impact our uh, our cities and our economic life in general so here is like the first uh, piece of historical knowledge 
we see this pandemic as something completely new, as something unexpected. But here is the thing. Cities have been there for millennia, for centuries, for, for hundreds and thousands of years. Huh? Essentially, all our civilization, such as we know it, is developed around cities or with cities in it as special, very important structures. And now, epidemic diseases, sometimes very violent, very cruel, very lethal, have been breaking essentially all the time that relative epidemic safety that we had been experiencing since, let's say, the 1960s is, some is something historically very new. Apparently, we have never experienced before the invention and the large widespread prevalence of vaccines and before the widespread prevalence of basic health care, we have never experienced as a civilization, as a species, such a level of epidemic safety. Things that we have been, or, or uh, things that we used to do until recently, for example, hugging strangers in the street, traveling in horribly crammed and crowded uh, means of public transport like uh, subway or buses or tramways, uh, habits such as staying close to one another in a crowded store. This is all something that our ancestors, like 200 years ago, would be extremely wary and extremely cautious to do. Uh, I uh, being 52, so I'm being born in 1968, even I remember that when I was a little kid, like in the 1970s, when someone suddenly coughed in my presence, adult people used to say, be careful, this person might be spreading tuberculosis. So this is how used we have become very quickly to that epidemic safety. And COVID-19 essentially brings us like back to the long-term reality. Epidemics are there, infections are there, and we have to pay attention to them. And here I allow myself to present like the first reading from, my, uh, from one of my favorite writers and authors in the, ter in the field of social sciences. It is Fernand Brodel, a French historian, and from his book Civilization and Capitalism, Volume 1, The Structures of Everyday Life, The Limits of the Possible. Uh, it is a passage which he entitled Ebb and Flow. Ebb and Flow, between the 15th and the 18th century, if the population went up or down, everything else changed as well. When the number of people increased, production and, and trade also increased. But demographic growth is not an unmitigated blessing. It is sometimes beneficial and sometimes the reverse. When the population increases, its relationship to the space it occupies and the wealth at its disposal is, is altered. It crosses critical thresholds and at each one its entire structure is questioned afresh. Now, what is being questioned afresh uh, during the pandemic. I think that the question, the big question is can we sustain the kind of density in cities that we have been sustaining until recently? My big intuition is that SARS-CoV-2 as a virus is a really is really a city sleeker. It is a city boy or, or a city girl. Viruses have no sex or gender, but I use for the sake of like presentational convenience the the expression of city boy. That virus is like made for cities. It spreads quickly, it breeds slowly, it uh, works by 
by widespread, like silent, invisible contagion, rather than by aggressive decimation of the whole population. So this specific pathogen is like made for cities. And the question is, how will we, living in cities, accommodate with that, with that pandemic, which is likely to last at least two years, maybe longer? Uh, and here is another question I ask. Have we gone into lockdowns out of sheer fear of an un unknown danger or are we working through the deep social change with positive expected outcomes? So are lockdowns like that ebb and flow, so an expression of temporary panic in front of a danger? Or are we somehow durably changing our ways of life? Here I found a paper uh, which is still at the stage of preprint. Here is the title Time, Space and Social Interactions Exit Mechanisms for the COVID-19 Epidemics. And here is, it is still at the stage of, pre of, of preprint, as I said. And here is the full bibliographical reference such as I could find it. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven authors. Scala, Flori, Spelta, Brunioli, Sinelli, Quattro, Siocci, oh my god, I hope I pronounce it correctly, and Pamolli. And uh, it is to be printed in the journal Physics and Society. Uh, it is essentially based on the development of the COVID-19 epidemic in northern Italian uh, cities and in the northern part of Italy in general. And in the paper, the authors tried to trace the possible scenarios of the epidemic spread after the lockdowns are lifted. I use that paper just to show the general assumptions that are used in this case. Uh, they use a, a, what is called a compartmental epidemic model, and I use their model to orient my thinking. So they assume, uh, the authors uh, of that paper, that our exposure to contagion with COVID-19 is a combination of three types of factors, biological, technological and social. Uh, so there is the biology of the virus and our own biology. There is the technological context like testing, screens, masks, medicines, a possible vaccine in the future. And there is the social context. So the way we in interact, so the way we pass the virus to each other. And that distinction is useful to remember because especially in those lockdowns in the spring and in in the case of any possible new restrictions that we put on ourselves in connection with the pandemic our reaction to the spread of the virus is mostly social because our biology stays constant at least over some time our technology on the short run is constant too. So what we change, what we use in the presence of the pathogen are social patterns, are patterns of behavior. So I made that little scheme uh, that we have a certain, uh, a, a certain map, a certain set of social interactions and those social interactions can uh, range all the way from those which are endowed with a low risk of infection. So we can have those social interactions with, uh, which are stable, predictable and with knowingly healthy people. So with the people who, about whom we can reasonably expect they are healthy and they don't transmit the virus. 
and it can range our or our social in interactions can range all the way from those social interactions to those endowed with a high risk of infection. So they are essentially interactions with people about whom we don't know whether they are healthy and whether they can spread the virus. And that set of social interactions, which obviously connect all the varieties on the, on, on the scale that I have just shown, that set of social interactions is combined with a set of social roles. So those permanent patterns of behavior which determine our place in the social structure. And now I tried to mathematize the problem. So I made like a manifold of two dimensions. There is one dimension. So the likelihood of infection attached to a social role. This is like one axis, the horizontal axis of that manifold. And there is the uh, a, another one, the vertical one. Can I rotate it? No. It is the prevalence of the given social role uh, in the society. So the probability that a random person endorses this social role. So in short, each social role is associated with a certain likelihood of infection attached to it. And I assume that there is something like a frontier here in red, in those red points. Uh, the uh, frontier that is tolerable to any society. And if the pandemic is going to lie, uh, to last, ex excuse me, uh, then uh, we are likely as a society to, to drift slowly towards social roles which are like under that red frontier, those which are associated with a relatively low likelihood of infection. And now I return to our historical experience, because my point is that the speed we, at, at, at which we entered into lockdowns indicates for me that it was something more than just a panic reaction. My point was that we have a historical experience like deeply ingrained into our collective unconscious. And this is the experience of living in cities and thriving in cities in the presence of epidemic diseases, in the presence of risk of possibly lethal infection. I assume that lockdowns are complex social behavior and therefore they can be performed only to the extent of previously acquired learning. So we need as a civilization to have practiced some kind of lockdown style behavior earlier and probably through many generations in order to do it massively right now. My point is that we are repeating right now some kind of long term historically formed collective ritual. And here I go once again to the civilizational role of cities. I drift a bit intuitively towards my reading of Fernand Braudel, his book uh, Civilization and Capitalism. And here I, uh, I will do a little bit of reading from another chapter of that book entitled Towns and Cities. So let's stroll a little bit with Professor Brodel and see his take on the role of cities. Towns are like electric transformers. They increase tension, accelerate the rhythm of exchange and constantly recharge human life. They were born of the oldest and most revolutionary division of labor between work in the fields on the one hand and the activities described as urban on the other. The antagonism between town and country begins with the transition from barbarism to civilization, from tribe to state, 
from locality to nation and runs through the whole history of civilization to the present day, as wrote the young Marx. Towns, the cities are turning points, watersheds of human history. When they first appeared, bringing with them the written word, they opened the door to what we call now history. The revival in Europe in the 11th century marked the beginning of the continent's rise to eminence. When they flourished in Italy, they brought the age of the Renaissance. So it has been since the city-states, the Polais of ancient Greece, the Medinas of the Muslim conquest, to our own times. All major bursts of growth are expressed by an urban explosion. To ask whether the towns were the origin or cause of growth is as meaningless as asking whether capitalism was responsible for the economic progress of the 18th century or the Industrial Revolution. What Georges Gurvich used to call the reciprocity of perspectives is relevant here. Towns generate expansion and are themselves generated by it. But even when towns do not create growth from scratch, they undoubtedly channel its course to their own advantage. And growth can be perceived in the towns and cities more clearly than anywhere else. Okay, so after that short reading from Fernand Brodel, I return to my own much more modest PowerPoint presentation. And I return to that problem of pandemic in cities. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, we have so much trouble with uh, seems to be particularly at ease uh, in cities. And there is a something about the urbanization of the mankind which you can find, uh, for example, uh, at the website of the World Bank under the link which is displayed here on the screen. Do you see it on the screen? Yes, you can see it on the, on the screen. And uh, if, if you want, you just uh, contact me via comments to that YouTube video and you can, and I can send you the link. Anyway, that link leads uh, to a coefficient of urbanization uh, on the planet, on Earth. And there is an interesting thing. Uh, when the SARS-CoV-1 ep epidemic uh, broke out in 2003, global uh, coefficient of urbanization just passed the threshold of 43%. And, and lately, uh, and the latest data available uh, for 2018 is at 55.27%. Why do I attach so much importance to those 43% of coefficient of urbanization? So 43% of mankind living in cities. I found an interesting analogy with... Uh, uh, the, the ep epidemic of Ebola in Africa during the years 2014 through 2016. During that time, the whole Ebola epidemic was de facto concentrated in three countries, in Liberia, in Guinea, and in Sierra Leone. And you can see that over, roughly speaking, the window of, uh, of Ebola epidemic in those uh, three countries, they were all the three going through uh, an intense and visible progressing urbanization. You can see here the percentage of urban population in total population for those three countries since 2015 until 2018. Each time you have a growth, and it is an important growth. And when they were going through that intense accelerating urbanization, the epidemic of Ebola developed there. There seems, there's, there seems to be like a connection between our exposure to epidemics and the density of urban population. Whence my general question? 
where are we going to go now as a civilization in the presence of the COVID-19 pandemic? Here I allow myself a little analogy uh, of, the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to something typically urban. I compare it to Prada shoes. It is a virus which really, which with the modality of spreading it has, it has like uh, any perspectives for being there around for a long time only in densely populated places like cities. Now I pass to something which I essentially, I honestly admit, I like, I love talking about, so to the connection between our behavior and our civilization. So there is that basic uh, constatation, basic, uh, that basic claim that what happens to our human civilization depends very largely on our behavior, on, on what we do. Hmm? In that uh, slide, I place a man on the construction site back to back with those uh, Egyptian ruins because there is a connection. Those fantastic structures were created because someone, as this gentleman in the picture next to it, because someone made it. And once again, a closer look, and once again a reference to Fernand Brodel, uh, as it comes to the importance of epidemics for our demography. Uh, looking more closely at Western Europe, one finds that there was a prolonged population rise between 1100 and 1350, another between 1450 and 1650, and the third after 1750. The last alone was not followed by a regression. Here we have three broad and comparable periods of biological expansion. The first two were followed by recessions, one extremely sharp between 1350 and 1450, the next rather less so between 1650 and 1750, better described as a slowdown than as a recession. And every recession solves a certain number of problems, removes pressures and benefits the survivors. It is, pretty, it is pretty drastic, but nonetheless a remedy. Inherited property became concentrated in a few hands immediately after the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century, and the epidemics which followed and aggravated its effects. Only good land continued to be cultivated, less work for greater yield. The standard of living and real earnings of the survivors rose. Men only prospered for short intervals and did not realize it until it was already too late. This is another point of that whole big thread of research and thinking that I've been doing about cities, their civilizational role and what can happen in that context due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As a species, we seem to be historically habituated. We, have, we seem to have historically learned that pattern, demographic depression, demographic expansion, like a very long cycle of breathing. We inhale and we exhale. Maybe what we are going through right now is like a distant echo of what we have gone through many times in the past. Uh, when I will be uh, referring to behavior and to behavioral study and to behavioral approach in this video and in other videos, uh, it is, uh, I, I will be frequently re referring to one uh, 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 other writer Frederick Skinner or Burhus Frederick Skinner, uh, the, f the founding father of the so-called behavioral psychology. I use it, I use his writings essentially because uh, it is an example of science which generally, which generated unwillingly an incredible amount of bullshit. Hmm? 
and it is important to understand it in the context of that COVID-19 pandemic because the virus gives us behavioral reinforcements. As I said, our at least short term and most likely the long term reaction to the pandemic is and will be very largely social. We will modify our social structure, probably. We are already modifying the pattern of our social roles and social interactions. It is all behavioral reinforcement. And I want to bring up uh, by the end of this specific video a few basics as for behavioral reinforcement. Negative reinforcements are usually much stronger than positive ones, but in the same time they are less workable and flexible. This is what Skinner wrote. And in this specific context, I think that the fear of being contaminated, the fear of contracting COVID-19 is a typical negative reinforcement which is strong but sort of simplistic. It can just bring very like crude, very, um, let's say, very crude and very short-termist modifications in our behavior. But what is really going to modify our behavior uh, like in a complex manner, I think, will be uh, the set of positive reinforcements that we will have in the presence of COVID-19. For example, positive reinforcements to create technologies that solve problems arising from the negative reinforcement. Another thing about the present situation and about behavioral reinforcements is that all living organisms are naturally exploratory. And exploratory behavior is reinforced by positive and negative stimuli. So what we are doing right now in the presence of pandemic is not just hiding and waiting out. Even if we don't, if, even if we are not full, uh, fully aware of it, we are exploring as a civilization, as a species, new ways of being around together. Uh, together being, uh, uh, we are exploring new ways of being a civilization in the presence of the pandemic. And those new ways are really some old ways that we remember from the past. And here, once again, I return to the writings of Mr. Skinner and an important claim, very important in, in, in the context that I am discussing. Positive stimulation triggers the building up of a strategy. And here comes a direct quote from Skinner. A better way of making a tool, growing food or teaching a child is reinforced by its consequence the tool, the food, or a useful helper, respectively. A culture evolves when practices originating in this way contribute to the success of the practicing group in solving its problems. It is the effect on the group, not the reinforcing consequences for individual members, which is responsible for the evolution of the culture. Important to remember in this situation. And Skinner, Burkhus Frederick Skinner claimed that we humans have a unique ability to scale and combine positive reinforcement and this is, we, uh, and this is how we have built the thing we call civilization. So my big question is now that uh, as we have the pandemic and of course as we have climate change just waiting around the corner to kick in and to remind us about its importance if we want to survive and, and if we want to thrive, we need to build up those big sets, big combinations of positive behavioral reinforcements. And I wonder what it will be. Okay, that would be all in this video. I remind you that this is the first video in an educational series devoted to urban economics 
and city management and and well see you later in other videos and in other updates on my scientific channel have fun with science and have fun with life bye